Ryan here with Dark Rangers Inc. And when it comes to upgrading your astrophotography gear or results, a lot of you guys, you're probably thinking about something like this. And if you're not thinking about one of those big ticket items specifically, you at least know you're probably gonna have to break out this and it's gonna be just as painful to your bank account as it's going to be fun when the stuff comes in the mail. Fortunately, sometimes just something as simple as a scope cover that I went over in my top accessories or other gear to get for astrophotography can be a really nice upgrade for not a lot of money because it goes back to the old adage, the scope you use the most is the best. So the easiest easier it is to have your gear already set up polar line and ready to go the more likely you are to image if you know you have to spend 20 minutes setting it all up the likelihood of you shooting and getting data is a little bit lower now if you're like me i used to think the exact same way before i did this channel i was always obsessing over the next big ticket item to buy i thought the only way i was going to take my astrophotography to the next level was to spend a bunch of money and in most cases you are going to have to invest some of that hard-earned cash but there are a lot more effective ways to get more out of your astrophotography without spending a ton of money and that's what I want to focus on today now I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like gear doesn't matter it absolutely does there is a baseline level of gear that you want to get to in order to ensure that you are gonna get a good return on your time and knowledge investment when it comes to processing but there are a lot of other things that you can do to improve your astrophotography images in the meantime later on in the video you, I will go over what I think is the best order of operations in terms of when to upgrade what and which one to do before the other. I've had the opportunity to learn a lot about what you guys are doing over the last several months, both from a gear and a processing standpoint, because I've had dozens of you guys send me both your final images and your master lights from all different types of gear. So I've been able to use data from different cameras, telescopes, mounts, filters, etc. And one thing that I would say is in common with all of you guys is everybody is producing really solid images, but with the exception of maybe one or two of you, there was a little bit more that I was able to pull out of each master light, whether it was a little bit more color, vibrancy, or maybe just a little bit cleaner overall image, which means we all have room to grow into the equipment that we already have. Now, this actually comes at a really interesting time because in addition to be able to help you guys out via YouTube, I've also been asked by Telescope Live to go from an affiliate and a partner to an official tutor with some pretty big names like Adam Block and Warren Keller. So it's very humbling. But one thing that I'll say as a result of joining the Telescope Live team and being able to use their data and practice more and more throughout the weeks is it's amazing how big of a difference there is with people that have the exact same set of data in terms of the final image quality. It really shows me that for most people, the biggest gap in your astrophotography images has nothing to do with the equipment and is much more related to the skies you're shooting in or the techniques you're using in terms of processing. So then how do you invest your time and money? Well, I would start with finding a tutor or somebody that works well with you, whether it's a mentor that you know personally. There is a whole list of tutors on Telescope Live, including myself, as well as other resources out there. Really fine tune your image processing before you drop the big bucks on that next piece of gear. Set a goal for yourself. For me, for example, I just recently found out a couple weeks ago that you actually have to hit a button to have your Astro Bin images submitted for an APOC. Pod. So for me, I've made the deal with myself. I'm not going to upgrade one of the major components of my rig until I win an Astrobin APOD. I recently did get one of the Telescope Live ones, but there's a lot more competition on Astrobin. And so that's a little deal I've made with myself to really make sure that I'm getting the most out of the equipment that I currently own. So if you're in an area that doesn't allow you to shoot a lot, I would encourage you to either check out some friends data, share it with other people, or some Sign up for something like Telescope Live and see what content they have available and really start to work with somebody one-on-one -on -one and really develop a relationship and hone those skills outside of just looking at equipment. The other thing that I'd like to recommend that I've talked about in previous videos uh, when I've done travel videos is really getting out under dark skies. So for the cost of a $15 campsite, you can vastly improve your image and your data quality just by getting out under border 
Bortle 1, 2, 3, or 4 skies, especially if you're in a Bortle 7 through 9 city. That's a really easy way for you to get out and instead of spending money, invest some time and effort to really up your game. And if you're wondering how big of a difference will Dark Skies really make, the best example I can give you is when my skill and equipment were at an all-time low. I think if we look at astrophotography results and upgrading them, there's really three categories you can look at. The processing skill and how good you are at physically manipulating your data once you get it, the sky conditions in which you shoot under, and then the actual equipment that you have. So when the equipment I had and my skill set was at its absolute low, AKA my first deep space target I went after, I actually went to some of the best skies that I've been under. I went to Gila National Forest in New Mexico, a legitimate Bortle one. I was at 9,800 feet, so up above a lot of potential atmospheric issues, and it was the night of the new moon. Now, I didn't even have a operating system or guiding or anything like that. I just had a Skyguider Pro, my mirrorless camera, and a 70 to 200 millimeter lens. I was going after Ro Afuki. I was struggling with it all night because it was my first time ever using the setup. I was only able to get six good two minute exposures. Again, this was unguided at about 200 millimeters and I didn't have pics in sight or anything like that at the time. So I actually just stacked it in Photoshop, which is really not a great stacking software. And as you can see, the image I was able to get was actually pretty decent. There's no calibration frame, so no darks bias, uh, flats, nothing like that. Obviously there are issues. I really didn't know what I was doing in terms of editing, but you could imagine if I was able to get a couple hours of this data, put it into PixInsight with the editing ability I have now, how much better this would really be. So you can offset some of the other deficiencies you have in that triangle. So sometimes you can use effort to overcome either a skill gap or maybe not having the funds to do any of the big up Upgrades. If we want to look at that other bucket of processing and think about what are the software changes that we want to make first? Well, if you don't have Pics in sight, that would be my first suggestion. That's really kind of the base software. A lot of plugins and other tools feed into it. Some of those are actually free, and some of them, like the ones from RC Astro, which is a partner of the channel, obviously those have a cost to them. But before I did anything, I would get Pics in sight if I were you looking to upgrade your processing game. It's going to give you features that Cyril or some of the other free softwares don't. And the nice thing is it is a one-time purchase and you're good for life. Now, once you've made that, the way I would prioritize the plugins is I would do Blur Exterminator first because it does multiple things and it solves the issue of needing to do deconvolution, which is probably one of the most skill heavy things that you can do in PixInsight as well as it's very timely. It takes a lot of time time and processing power to get through. So I would do Blur Exterminator first. Now, when deciding to go with Noise or Star Exterminator next, I would decide if you want to add Photoshop into your situation. Uh, it's about $9.99 a month, and that includes Lightroom and some cloud space, which is really nice. If you have an iPhone and a PC, I know some of you guys have to email yourself the photo or do it manually if you want full resolution. The nice thing is with the Adobe Cloud, you can save it full size and then just simply download download it from the cloud onto your phone. But you're gonna do stuff in Photoshop that no matter how good you get at PixInsight, you simply will not be able to accomplish. I think that's really where you can set yourself apart as an astrophotographer in terms of your creativity and style. Most people can kind of get to the exact same spot in PixInsight. It's really in Photoshop or other post-processing softwares where you can really differentiate yourself. Photoshop is really what's gonna allow you to get the most out of your data once you've kind of scrubbed it in PixInsight. So usually the data that I take to Photoshop is about 80 to 85% done. And I do that last 10 to 15%, maybe 20% in Photoshop to really dress it up and take it to the next level. Now, the reason I say it depends is because there are some noise reduction softwares in Photoshop that you can kind of lean on if you're trying to save a couple dollars and not do it all at once. I'm gonna be doing a 60 minute video for my first 
published content for Telescope Live's website, all on Photoshop. So there will be more help from me specifically, as well as some of the videos that I've already done. If you're not going to add Photoshop, then I would definitely do Noise Exterminator next, and then you can do Star Exterminator later on. I do think personally, for me at least, it works better than Starnet. And I think for the price, it's a very good upgrade that will allow it to give you the best results possible. Because when you are editing at an advanced level, you're typically wanting to separate your stars. All right, I'll get off of my soapbox about processing and getting under dark skies. Let's dive into the equipment conversation. Now, the first thing you wanna look at with any astrophotography setup is of course the mount. That is the foundation of any rig, and it's really going to make sure that you actually get the best results out of everything that's sitting on top of it. You could have the best glass and camera in the world, but if your guiding isn't accurate enough to match the resolution of your imaging train, then you're not gonna get good results anyway. Way. And so what do I mean by that? There's really two parts you want to look at at least, but the two basic things when deciding whether or not you need to upgrade your mount is the carrying capacity, which most people think of, and second, the resolution of your imaging train. You want to use a calculator like this one from Astronomy Tools, and you're going to put the focal length of the longest scope that you have or the scope you're looking to buy. So for me, without the reducer on, my scope is 540 millimeters with the 1X flattener, and and the pixel size for the 2600 is 3.76 micron, giving me a resolution of 1.44 arc seconds per pixel. So I know my guiding needs to be at least that or better, even under the worst possible conditions. So for me, I don't necessarily need to obsess over 0.3 guiding, but I want to be around one arc second or better, so I have a little bit of room to spare. A lot of people will buy scopes that are lightweight and so don't have a big capacity problem like an SCT, maybe the Edge 8 or 9.25. But if we take that same pixel size and add it versus a 2350 focal length like the Edge 9.25, might weigh about the same as my 90 millimeter APO, but now you're talking about a 0.3 arc second resolution versus 1.44. So now my guiding has to be much better. I'm probably looking at off access guiding to even have a chance with my current mount, which is the a AM5, um, and even then it's going to be challenging. So you don't want to just look at the carrying capacity. You want to see, does it have the ability to guide at an accuracy level that you're going to need based on your resolution? If you've checked those boxes and you're good to go, then I would say don't upgrade your mount. There's no reason to arbitrarily until you need to. Once you've figured out whether you want to upgrade your mount or not, the next discussion is really between the telescope and the camera. And unless there's something specifically wrong with your scope or the focal length is way off, I'm almost always gonna recommend upgrading the camera first, as I think you'll see a bigger increase in image quality, especially if you're going from something really basic or even a non-astrophotography camera, like maybe a cheaper DSLR. Now, in terms of the minimum level of quality that I would suggest, the 533 sensor is really gonna give you something that's gonna look almost about the same as a 26 or 6200. The big difference is gonna be in the sensor size. You are going from 14 to 16 bit, going from the 533 to the 2600, but in terms of image quality, I've edited a ton of data from those cameras and they're very similar. And the nice thing is there are a lot of options. Player One makes one, it's called the Saturn, QHY and Morovian as well as ZWO have something with that sensor and you don't need to get into the monochrome or one shot color debate because it's offered in both. Now I would really recommend this if you're kind of between two and 400 millimeters in focal length. If you're much above that, you're gonna wanna go with probably the 2600 and get that APS-C size sensor. Otherwise you're gonna be really limited in your target selection and you're gonna end up doing a lot of mosaics, which unless you have clear skies all the time, is going to limit the number of total images you're gonna be able to produce. If you're something at the really high end, like with an SCT or maybe a really big APO, then I'd probably recommend looking at the 2600 or even the 6200 because the only real difference between those two cameras is gonna be an APS-C versus a full frame sensor. All the other stats are essentially exactly the same. So to kind of keep it simple, shorter focal length, 533, something in the middle to larger 2600, and if you're going with something with a super long focal length, you're definitely gonna to wanna to look 
look at something with a full frame sensor. When it comes to picking out a scope, I have a couple of quick tips. Look for something with at least FPL 53 glass and something that comes with a test report. That's why I went with my Starfield Gear Series versus Ascar or some of the other brands where you don't know what glass they have. They're just listed as ED and they don't come with a Strel report. I know the Strel on my scope was 0.981, which is really good. And so for either the same amount of money or maybe just a little bit more, I'm going to choose an option where I know what I'm getting. I also like to go with something that does have a flattener reducer as well as just a flattener. That way I can shoot the scope at its native focal length and I can also slap a reducer on and I basically get two scopes in one. So with mine, it's a 90 millimeter at F6. So with the flattener, it's 540 millimeters F6. But if I put a 0.8 reducer, it's 432 millimeters at F4.8. So I basically get two scopes in one. With something like the Red Cat series, they don't make reducers for it that I know. I'm sure you could maybe retrofit something else onto it, but I don't really want to mess with that. However, there are some pets full style scopes, meaning a scope that doesn't need a field corrector on it, that do still have reducers, and Ascar and some other brands um, have those as well. So those are the three criteria I look for, FPL 53 glass, a laser inferometer test with a Strel ratio, and the ability to shoot it at 1x, but also with a reducer as well. And so that's really it for the big ticket items. The final thing I would talk about are filters, and I have a couple of videos that I'm gonna come out with here in the very near future. One on the Antlia quad band that has been shipped out to me, and then one on a couple of dual narrow band filters where I'm gonna do a one-shot color workflow on doing the SHO Hubble palette with a set of dual narrow band filters, so HA03 and O3S2. So filters can make a huge impact for a very small amount of money, especially if you're in a light polluted area or you wanna go for some specific targets. So that can be a piece of hardware that can cost you anywhere from maybe a couple hundred to three to four hundred dollars that can have a dramatic impact on your overall image. So look for those videos to come out. You'll get a better idea because I will not only show you the results, but how I edit and work with them. And so in the meantime, guys, I know I covered a lot of topics, but I wanted to go over kind of that triangle of upgrading when it comes to products processing, equipment, and getting under dark skies. I think if you think in terms of improving that triangle, you're going to upgrade your astrophotography from a number of different angles and end up with a better overall result. So guys, until the next one, thanks for tuning in and clear skies.